Hello and welcome to Turf Truth Tuesday where we look at claims in the turf grass industry and ask, are they true? If you're new to the channel, you may like to subscribe for future content. John Perry is the president, CEO and founder of Green County Fertilizer, and runs a channel called Lawncology. A channel so full of misinformation, we could probably debunk a video every week for a year, and not repeat ourselves once. So without further ado, let's turn on the BS counter and get started. The nitrogen levels that are being pushed currently through taking these soil tests, and, and there's no testing for nitrogen unless you request it. Um, it's just, you know, you throw your four pounds out. Well, if you take the course of a season and uh, say in, again, anywhere, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. You know, when somebody says to me, Bermuda's a nitrogen hog, you look at the recommendations from a from a fertility dealer, it's four pounds of in. If it's St. Augustine, it's four pounds of in. If it's fescue, it's four pounds of in. If it's bluegrass, it's four pounds of in. All survey said. Not true. Nitrogen recommendations vary according to the location and turf grass species. These recommendations were determined through a process that we will discuss in a moment. It's just, just here, this is just what it is. I mean, maybe you'll fluctuate and see it at three or three and a half. Uh, if you live in an area where there's restrictions, they just automatically kick it down to those. It's two and a half. So there's not like a necessarily a real science behind the recommendations when it comes to turf. All survey said. Not true. Turfgrass nitrogen recommendations are in fact, the most well-studied nutrient recommendation. Whether you are in Europe, Asia, Australia, the States or elsewhere, the process is basically the same. A calibration is conducted to determine the minimum and maximum turfgrass response to nitrogen. The response variable may differ according to the location, but it is normally turfgrass quality or growth rate. From the calibration, a maximum and minimum nitrogen recommendation is determined via one of several different response curves. Because soil testing as a whole has been meant for crops. Crops are based on removal of nutrients. All survey said. Yes, soil testing has been designed for crops, but this assertion is not entirely accurate. Yes, soil test recommendations in agriculture account for adding back nutrients that were depleted by the crop. However, it is the increase in profit probability that drives soil test recommendations in agriculture, not just the depletion of soil nutrients. Soil tests should not be used for fertilizer recommendations. In general, this can be true depending on the location and whether the specialists have conducted the proper calibrations. They shouldn't. They shouldn't. They're a roadmap. They're a roadmap for how your program should actually look. And if you're going to go through the process and take a soil test, which is great, I, I totally recommend doing that, but I don't recommend following what it says across the bottom of that page. And anytime you send through it, it says, well, based on your area and, and blah, 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 you're going to need four pounds of this, a pound of this, and two pounds of this. Put it out through this particular material. And then that, that's just basically giving you a roadmap of what to buy not actually what your soil needs. All survey said. Incorrect. Yes, soil tests that have not been calibrated to turf grass may provide inaccurate recommendations. However, if properly calibrated, the soil test recommendations are based upon a probability of response. Because it's very rare that micronutrient recommendations are made beyond sulfur and magnesium. All survey said. Well, you are correct about one thing. It is rare. In fact, it is so rare that it has never happened. Sulfur and magnesium have never been recommended as micronutrients, because sulfur and magnesium aren't micronutrients. They're macronutrients. John digresses again here. Let's skip ahead. What I want to look at, I, I kind of do the first three things. pH, vitally important. We agree. Organic matter. I want to know organic matter because of the release rate of the N that's in there. And I always test for nitrogen. Now, there's kind of two schools of thought on that. There is uh, some people who say nitrogen is stable. Uh, some people who say what's there today is gone tomorrow. There's, it's kind of actually both ways. All survey said. No, it is not both ways. There is no knowledgeable soil scientist that would ever claim that nitrogen is stable in any soil of agronomic importance. Traditional soil tests are generally useless to practitioners in providing nitrogen recommendations due to the very reason that nitrogen changes rapidly in soils. Now, as I mentioned before, about for every 1% of organic matter, you're getting 20 pounds of free nitrogen. Obviously, this can vary greatly. But, in general, this is true. And then we're going to jump over into CECs. Now, CECs, in general, 
are, are going to just kind of tell what type of soil you have. Uh, the higher the CEC is going to be towards the clay side, the lower towards sand. Now, the numbers that are based in order to make that saturation uh, are going to be calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. At this point, he is going to go into base saturation. Base saturation is a soil test interpretation that has been completely debunked in both agriculture and turf grass. We will be doing an entire video on base saturation, but for now, let's see how deep of a hole he digs for himself. Uh, and you'll see hydrogen in there, but those are basically the sum of your cations. So it's going to read through that level. They're going to show you your hydrogen level uh, and what percentage that's taking up your calcium level, magnesium, blah, blah, blah. So in a good healthy soil system, you're looking for a calcium and magnesium balance to equal about 80% of that total. That's pretty important. Our survey said... No, it is not. This issue of balancing soil cations is only important to people who are illiterate in soil science and some salesmen. Base cation saturation is a very clever way to sell product because no matter what the soil test results are, they can be interpreted as you need to apply fertilizer. Calcium is too high, apply magnesium. Magnesium is too high, apply calcium. It is an absurd and a demonstrably false method of interpreting a soil test, which is one reason that in the last several years, many university labs have removed it from their reports. Um, if your hydrogen is too high, that means that your pH is super low. You've got really low pH and a lot of material is not going to be releasing. So you're going to have to adjust that pH up and usually that would come from liming. And depending on, on how bad it is, you could choose which kind of lime or if your magnesium is low or if your cat, you, there's, there's different choices. Um, you know, gypsum, which is actually going to contain sulfur. Uh, usually that's done in more alkaline soils to bring pH down and give it some calcium. Our survey said... You truly are illiterate in soil science. Gypsum has no influence on soil pH except in sodic soils, which we will explain in detail in a separate video. The sulfur in sulfate has already been oxidized, and therefore will not reduce pH. Remember, when it comes to soil science, you are here. Think about it. Uh, dolmitic limestone, which contains magnesium, and calcitic limestone, which is about 31% calcium. So depending on if you're magnesium or your calcium, what's off or on, you can pick what kind of lime you want to use. It is true that based upon soil test magnesium, you may choose between calcitic or dolomitic lime. However, the decision to apply calcitic or dolomitic lime should be based upon the magnesium concentration, not the base saturation. This has absolutely nothing to do with base saturation or the ratio of calcium to magnesium. Turfgrass has been shown to grow perfectly fine in a wide range of calcium to magnesium ratios, and anyone who continues to preach this message is almost literally exploding with bullshit. Thanks, George. So these are kind of vitally important pieces. Oh, I don't want to see that hydrogen level high. I would like to see the potassium at a certain point, the calcium and magnesium equaling 80% of the sum total. Yes, and we would like to see the internet swept clean of all this BS, but we don't think that is going to happen. And then it can be kind of adjusted in there. Um, but so you have to have those balances of cations. Our survey said... This is demonstrably not true. Turfgrass can, and does, thrive in a wide range of cation ratios. Remember, people who claim this are... Almost literally exploding with bullshit. Thanks, George. So, soil testing has extreme value and and I love looking at reports and and even just yesterday yeah, the last few days I've seen uh, some colleagues and uh, some professionals posting soil reports online asking you know what do I do about this what do I do I love to chime in on those with all due respect please don't clearly you are illiterate in soil science providing your input on soil test recommendations is only going to continue to muddy the once clean waters of turf grass science John digresses again here. Let's skip ahead. If I've got some saturations that are too high, say my calcium is at 80, 85%, and my magnesium is at like two or 3%. It won't matter. Well, in that particular scenario, I actually have to chew through this in order to make the magnesium more available. No, you don't. I don't have to add it. Now you can, and you can give your plant a foliar application of magnesium to kind of make up for it in the interim, but this is gonna to have to be hit with some serious acids in order to break that calcium down. And as the calcium drops like this, the magnesium will automatically start to come up. Automatically, without even adding it. Sure, that may occur. But there is no evidence to indicate that it needs to occur. 
And this is the point we think a lot of people miss. Of course, when you apply certain nutrients to the soil, the soil concentrations will likely change. But what is important is to know if that change was needed. So you're just breaking away things with strong acids in order to get it back down to a level to where everything else kind of balances out. But it's always 100%. You're just chewing through something in order to let another level rise. High quality bullshit. World class designer bullshit, to be sure. Hospital tested, clinically proven bullshit. But bullshit nonetheless. So, a lot of information out there about soil testing, a lot of home kits, but once you get the home kit, then what do you do? What do you do? I would invite anybody out there who watches my channel and watches others, if, if you uh, are subscribed to Alan, uh, to The Lawn Care Nut, to Pete, uh, to Matt Martin, um, to anybody who's, who talks about these soil tests, anybody, uh, feel free to shoot them to me. No thanks. Just a word to the wise, if you are working with someone who pulls out a soil test and starts rattling off information about base saturation, you would be best served to ignore him or her and go find a turfgrass scientist who actually knows something about soils. Well, there you have it. Loncology utterly debunked. I think we will see him again. Please don't forget to subscribe if you want to be notified of new content. We hope you have a wonderful week and check back next week where we will be discussing this. So I'm going to do a side-by-side -side comparison here basically. I'm going to use flagship on all of my yard, 15,000 square feet, except for my 5,000 strip of Bermuda in the front. I'm going to put down the expert on that area. So we're going to have a side-by-side -side to see which one really is better here. See you then.